So uh, tonight, as David said, this is the second of, of three uh, lectures in this series. Um, and tonight we're looking at um, adult genomics and uh, direct-to-consumer testing. And we'll look at a bit of, um, um, of the, I guess, theory behind uh, consent required for DNA testing as well. This follows on from our first lecture, um, which was on uh, prenatal and paediatric testing. And the last lecture in the series will be on cancer genomics, um, which is a large topic um, and deserving of its own um, talk. These lectures are um, um, a, a sponsor, sponsored affair from Queensland Genomics. As I said last time, Queensland Genomics um, exists thanks to $25 million from the Queensland government. Um, the government wanted to um, translate the vast uh, wealth of, of knowledge um, and advancement we've had in genomics over the last decade um, and integrate that into routine genetic care in Queensland. Uh, that requires multiple, um, I guess, prongs. So it's not only just buying machines that go bing, um, it's not just uh, staffing uh, genetic services or um, um, laboratories. It uh, requires a lot of integration, a lot of um, um, what they call translational research. So uh, getting our scientists uh, who sort of make the, the laboratory studies and um, uh, helping them with clinicians or they maybe even be the clinicians themselves. Um, and translate those findings into uh, real patient outcomes, health outcomes. So it's been a successful project. Part of the uh, multi-pronged approach though is also to educate people on how to use these technologies. And this uh, lecture series is a part of that, enabling the workforce and educating the workforce in genomics so that um, people um, across the, the spectrum, uh, whether they be uh, nurses, allied health, general practitioners, uh, specialists um, have an idea, a working understanding of genomics um, and how to integrate that into their own, um, their own practice. My philosophy um, is that, um, I guess I'd, I'd like this to be your lecture series. And so um, I'd like you to tell me what you want to know. So there was an invitation sent around with the pre-reading materials to access Slido before the event. Um, and pre-submit any questions you may have, um, or even pre-submit um, some cases that you may have come across um, just for sharing, and this could form a, a case-based discussion um, for this presentation, um, and, and something that we can, we can talk about as a group, as, or the best we can, um, using this uh, particular format, which is a bit difficult, I, I completely appreciate. Um, so far, um, I haven't had anyone submit anything, so we might not go the full two hours tonight. But if you do think of something that you um, want to ask, as long as it's not on cancer genomics, because I'll roll those questions over to the next one, um, but happy to answer any questions on prenatal or paediatric genomics, um, any of the topic that we speak about tonight. Or if you've got any cases that you've um, encountered in your general practice that you think might be of interest to the group, um, and something that um, we can uh, share and, and talk about as a group and I can comment on, um, please type those into Slido because uh, it does make for a, a richer experience. Generally, I give this type of presentation, um, you know, face to face and it's a bit more interactive. Um, it's a bit hard to translate that over um, Slido and, and the Zoom software we're, we're using, but we can try the best we can, hey? Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, CheckUp, um, CheckUp, um, is a partner in this project and they are overseeing um, the, the technical and governance support um, uh, for this lecture series. So a bit about me, um, I'm a um, well, paediatrician, not that I really practice that anymore, um, um, but also a clinical geneticist. Uh, the, um, at the moment I'm um, at Queensland University of Technology, as I said, and I uh, run the postgraduate uh, genomics programs here. So that's uh, teaching and, and training mainly laboratory scientists actually, although in past lives I have treated, uh, sorry, test, uh, trained um, clinical geneticists, genetic counselors as well. So they're kind of the three main um, 
um, spheres within uh, human genetics or human genetic diagnosis, the, the, the medical, the nurse, uh, the, the genetic counselling and the, um, the laboratory scientists. So uh, this job has uh, meant that I've uh, um, trained, uh, formally trained all, all three of the, of the main uh, groups. Um, I'm also collaborating with our nursing school here to enable uh, nurses to get, uh, have a greater role in um, genetic testing. So that's a bit about me. As I said, webinars are one, not a one-way street, and I really strongly encourage you to um, please uh, uh, get onto Slido. Um, and I've got I've got two screens here, so forgive me for looking both directions, but I'll keep an eye on the on the questions. And then Sabrina, who's working in the background, will um, tap me on the shoulder virtually anyway if um, I miss any of your questions. Um, as I said at the last lecture, this is a um, uh, um, resource put, it, put out by the RACGP. Um, it's freely available online, so you know, even if you are from the other school, by that I mean ACRAM, um, you know, this is available um, to, to everyone online. And it's a great little resource to have um, and a, you know, a, good, a good place to, to start if you've got a patient who you think might have a genetic condition or has a proven genetic condition. Um, it um, uh, talks about some of the uh, main uh, um, things you need to think about with genetics, um, about uh, testing, about genetic conditions, uh, scenarios, and then you, know, you might be able to read there on your screen a list of uh, common genetic conditions that might walk through the door in the general practice. So it's a, an easy place to start and it's good quality inf information that's um, been written and um, um, I guess edited by uh, genetic healthcare professionals from across um, Australia. So I do commend that resource to you. And um, um, it's a good thing just to, to have bookmarked if, if not printed out um, uh, for, for a, a good you know, reliable source, certainly more reliable than what you might find on a first pass Google search. Um, I'll just reiterate for those who weren't here last time, um, a couple of terminologies that you need to be familiar with. Uh, the first is this word genomics. Um, so um, most of us, except for, I guess, newly minted GPs would be familiar with the term genetics over genomics. Um, and genomics is a, a term um, which came about about, I suppose, I suppose 15 years ago, but started to become popular 10 years ago. And then like all the other omics are starting to, to, to take over. Um, the, a nice little de definition of what's, well, what's different about genomics and genetics. Um, well, genomics it means we're looking at all the DNA. So no longer are we looking at single genes. Um, uh, so a gene being a, a protein coding part of the DNA. We realize that you know, we're much more than the 20,000 genes or, um, that uh, um, are part of our DNA. There's all the bits in between which have important functions in uh, regulating the expression of, um, of DNA. And so uh, we're graduating from this um, world where we looked at a single gene into one in which we're looking at multiple genes, but not only the, the genes, but also those regulatory components. And so for conditions that um, express themselves differently between people, for um, uh, conditions which um, uh, might be different, have different penetrants in different people. So, um, meaning that people may or may not uh, develop the condition depending on whether they have um, a genetic fault. Even though we think about them as uh, single gene or Mendelian disorders, um, there are all these other part, uh, genetic components in the background which we're starting to look at and uh, I guess you know, bring into the equation um, um, as to you know, what does a gene fault mean. And so that's why this term genomics is uh, slowly replacing the term genetics. And so genetics is now sort of um, assuming a, a different de definition. Um, that is the study of hereditary and inherited disease. Um, as it's, it's, um, used to be just looking at a single gene, but it's, I guess it's kind of a, almost a science in its own right. The other term um, that you need to be aware of is a variant. So this is, um, um, one that I still have to uh, pull myself up on and, and use instead of mutation. 
Um, the word mutation got a bit too um, complex because different people used it for different reasons. Um, and so now we're talking, so now that was um, to make sure we're talk, all talking the same language, um, you'll see in um, DNA reports, um, whether they be at the chromosomal or single gene uh, level, um, the word variant rather than mutation. I think it'd be unusual for you to come across the word mutation actually in a report these days. Um, and variants, um, you know, we've all, we're all variant, we're all different from each other. So all our, all our genomes have variants. Um, so the question we want to um, uh, answer is a variant pathogenic or is it not pathogenic? Um, and so this is, these are the terminologies that you'll now see and hear used um, when people are talking about changes in the DNA um, rather than mutation. So the, the term mutation is kind of on the out. Um, genomics, as we said last time, can be used across the, the life spectrum. I'm not sure if my cursor uh, shows up on, this, on the screen. So last week we kind of looked at the, the left-hand side of this uh, of spectrum where we looked at prenatal screening, uh, carrier screening um, for individuals who are or wanting to become pregnant, uh, newborn screening and paediatric diagnoses. Tonight what we'll be looking at is uh, more in the, in the middle uh, here. So this is um, adult genetics, genomics, uh, disease pre predispositions, direct-to-consumer testing. Next week we'll um, look at um, uh, cancer. So adult genomics really is a very large field um, in its own right. Um, we won't talk about reproductive risk because we did that last week and we won't talk about cancer because we'll do that next, uh, sorry, last month and we won't talk about cancer because we'll do that uh, next month. Um, what we'll look at is uh, some um, adult onset disorders. So to try and differentiate um, from conditions that we looked at last time, um, which start to manifest in childhood. We'll look at conditions that start to manifest in adulthood. Um, now, there are you know, dozens, hundreds of these conditions, so we can't go through all those um, um, in detail. So I've just selected a few uh, conditions, uh, which are common ones, but if you've got a condition that you're interested in, then type it into Slido um, and we can talk about that as well. Um, if you've got a patient with a particular condition, um, I'm happy to talk to, the, talk to that, but I've just uh, chosen a couple that uh, might be of interest or should be of interest to you because they're, they're common. Um, and we'll talk about um, predictive um, pre-symptomatic testing, direct-to-consumer testing. Um, we won't go so much into pharmacogenetics and genomics, but I will uh, mention that as a part of the direct-to-consumer testing. Um, but it's probably worth having a bit of a chat about that um, um, at that point, I don't think I've got any slides on that, so I better remind myself to, to talk to you about the pharmacogenomics. Um, so I guess it's probably less of an issue, a little bit less of an issue, it's still, uh, uh, still a bit of an issue. So when I talk to people, say, who I went through medical school with, you know, people you haven't caught up with since you graduated, and they say, oh, what are you doing? I'm, I'm a clinical geneticist. You kind of get a bit of a puzzled look um, or one of almost or you know, they, they think, wow, you're, you must be really smart. You know, this is genetics. Wow, that's huge. Um, genetics is not any different to any other part of medicine. Um, it's, it's not a mysterious or, or esoteric trade um, by any means. It really is the same as any other branch of medicine. Um, it's, uh, I guess because it's kind of new and cutting edge, people think of it as a... Um, a, a, a uh, you know, a bit mysterious, um, but really it's not. Clinical diagnoses are made the same way as they are throughout, throughout medicine, and it's really pattern recognition. So when we look at genetic syndromes, a syndrome is really just a collection of features that occur more commonly in the one person um, than, than you can explain otherwise by chance. Um, and so the patterns um, themselves of the diseases, they tend to be rare, yeah, I certainly agree with that. Um, um, and that's probably gives rise to this um, reputation that genetics or genetic medicine has as being something, you know, a little bit esoteric. Um, but these are rare even to a clinical geneticist. Um, sure, there are common genetic conditions. Um, and so, you know, I guess uh, diseases that, you know, most individuals don't see in their practicing lifetime, a clinical geneticist 
is lucky enough to see once, maybe twice in their, their uh, career. Um, um, but, you know, they're obviously seeing a very selected group. Um, but there are the conditions that we come across that, um, you know, are reported, you know, once, twice in the world. And so what a clinical geneticist does is, um, you know, has the time, I guess, to look at an individual, look at the pattern um, um, that's appearing in that individual. So whether that be um, diseases, disease organs, uh, we look at uh, physical features such as facial features, um, look at laboratory parameters, whether that be imaging, um, hematology, um, electrolytes, liver functions, whatever. Um, but just like you do with any other patient, you bring all that information together and see if it fits a pattern. Now, if it's going to be a pattern that fits into something you've seen before, then obviously you're more likely to recognise it. But given that these things are, are rare, um, then um, it's you know, quite possible that it's a pattern that you won't recognise. And that's why clinical geneticists uh, tend to work in groups, um, because if you work in a group, then you know, hopefully one of your, if you haven't seen the, uh, the pattern before, hopefully one of your colleagues has. And we also have a number of databases at our disposal. Um, but what we um, do um, is think of red flags that um, make us think that a condition might be genetic. So these are um, clues, I guess, um, that a patient that's presenting before you might have a genetic condition. I guess these are things that I'd like to um, teach you tonight. Some of these um, red flags or clues that you might be dealing with genetic. So even if you, you don't know if the condition is genetic, I guess these are things that are worth having in the back of your mind that you think, oh, that's a bit weird. I wonder if this is genetic. So what are some of these red flags? Well, the first is a bit of a no brainer, really. Um, it's family history. So if a patient's got a um, condition, a particular rare condition, and someone else in the family has got the same condition, then obviously you're going to start thinking, well, is there something heritable here? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it is heritable. Um, certainly, you know, people in the same household um, are exposed to the same environmental um, uh, stressors. So it, it could equally be environmental. Or for a lot of conditions, it's a mixture. Um, it, it's... Uh, um, Poly, polygenic or it has, has multiple causes um, or complex disease and so they you know, and again people in the same household will um, have some genes in common they'll have some of their environment in common and so you can see things um, um, clustering in the family even though it might not be strongly genetic or, or um, Mendelian um, but obviously family history is a good place to start now as we discussed last time um, you know, all the textbooks, and I think, including that reference I um, showed to you at the start, will tell you that, you know, a three generation family tree is the gold standard. Um, so you need to start with your, your patient, um, you know, look at this, ask about their parents, ask about their siblings, ask about nieces, nephews, children. Um, but I completely appreciate that even that is going to be quite time consuming. Um, I mean, the idea about taking a, a um, comprehensive three-generation family trees, is it means that you're um, taking the time to focus on each individual within those three generations um, and ask specifically about each person's um, health, um, if, they've, if, they've, if they've died, the circumstances surrounding their death um, and, and pre-morbidities. Um, and then things can get very complex um, when dealing with um, people with half siblings, so it's a bit hard, it takes time to um, tease out whether a person has full siblings, half siblings, um, you can have blended families, um, and you know if we're dealing with a standard general practice consultation, of 15 minutes, there goes your 15 minutes, and so um, there are some quick and dirty um, uh, tricks you can use um, where you can take a bit of a family history. Um, you know, in less than 60 seconds. Um, and now I've never heard anyone, especially my colleagues, talk about these quick and dirties, um, but I will admit that they are uh, techniques that I, I personally have used if I'm um, um, in a hurry. So for instance, if I'm you know, having to do a ward consult and the patient um, is a child who's um, needing attention by their parent, I'm trying to get a history from their parent, and it's clear I'm not gonna be able to sit there and take 15 minutes of their time to 
um, get a family history, I'll ask um, three very specific questions. Um, and they are, is, has anyone else in your family had a similar illness or has anyone had um, a similar condition? Um, and quite often the answer is no. Um, what you want to do next is to get them to think beyond what they you know, might be thinking about their immediate family. So when you say family, people think about, you know, who's living in the same household usually. And so I specifically ask, you know, what about extended family? So cousins, aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, anyone um, that you're blood related to had had a similar issue. Um, thinking about those same individuals, has anyone had any other illnesses that you can tell me about, especially uh, unusual illnesses or long-term illnesses or something that you know, might have killed them or they died from. Um, and sometimes clues can come out from that sort of very quick and dirty family tree. So you're not actually taking family history as such. Um, you're really just doing a, a very brief screen asking about uh, family members. Um, but I think those three questions is a way, uh, a, you know, a shortcut. Um, and because it's a bit of a, you know, because it is a truncated screen, then you're less likely to pick up something than taking a proper three generational um, family history. But I think it's better than, you know, foregoing family history altogether because you don't have time. So what are you looking for when you take a family history? Um, well, obviously, you know, you're looking for people who may have had uh, the same illness or a, a similar illness. Um, but Diseases express themselves, uh, genetic diseases can express themselves differently in different people, even in the same family. Um, and this is true in particular of dominant conditions. Uh, so it's worth looking for individuals who have had um, diseases of the same organ. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a good example off the top of my head, but if you've got a individual who um, um, had some aberrant liver function tests, for instance, um, and they said that their um, uncle Joe died of liver cancer, um, then obviously they're different diseases, but they're the same organ. Um, and so that's, you know, start, start your brain thinking, could we be dealing with some sort of condition that affects the liver? Um, also looking for people with unusual um, or significant diseases. Um, so these, this is where we start to um, think of um, diseases um, which may be expressing themselves differently in different people. This is a term called variable expressivity. So, um, for instance, if a person before you has um, you know, aberrant kidney uh, function, for example, and great uncle Joe died of a brain aneurysm, um, you might not really link the two, um, but you know, renal disease, especially in a, in a young person, and you know, a brain aneurysm, um, they're, they're kind of two slightly unusual diseases. Um, and you need to start thinking, this could, be, could this be the same genetic disease expressing itself differently in different, in different organs? And this is known as variable expressivity, um, and which means a variance in the clinical signs or um, of a genetic disorder between two individuals. And we'll look at um, a bit more of that uh, in, in detail when we look at specific uh, conditions. So just because, you know, on face value, the two diseases um, um, don't, don't look to be related, um, it might be um, that there is a pattern there that you're just not immediately recognising. So other clues that might indicate a possible uh, genetic etiology, uh, young age of onset is um, um, a very good clue, in particular for, for common older diseases. So for instance, if we look at Alzheimer's disease, um, young onset Alzheimer's disease or dementia um, is, um, for, for a broader term, um, is actually less than 65 years. Um, so if someone, you know, I guess, was 63 and started um, dementing, um, that would be considered uh, young onset. If they're in their 30s, I'd have alarm, ringing, alarm bells ringing left, right and centre. To me, that's, that's going to be genetic. Um, and certainly there are heritable forms of Alzheimer's disease which can present um, that, that early. Similarly, coronary artery, coronary artery disease. Um, uh, because premature coronary artery disease is defined as less than 45. 
um, which doesn't actually sound all that old to me, um, but um, that's, that's what the textbooks tell us. So you need to start thinking, uh, could there be a uh, genetic cause for that? Um, and the most common of those are the familial dyslipidemias, um, which generally you can um, diagnose on a, a simple uh, lipid, lip, fasting lipid profile. Um, severe presentations, again, of a, typically of a, of a common disorder, might be a clue that you're looking at a genetic condition. So um, recurrent or easy fractures is, uh, is a, a feature of um, osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, now, there are many, well, there are, yeah, there are many types of osteogenesis imperfecta, um, and the mild ones um, are deforming, so uh, the term um, osteogenesis imperfecta, or OI for short, might bring up images of um, you know, children um, with quite deformed skeletal systems um, who are wheelchair bound, uh, but that's this, you know, down towards the severe end of the spectrum. There are mild end of the spectrum. And so, uh, uh, you know, individuals who have, um, you know, twist their ankle and break their leg because they're wearing high heels uh, one week and then um, break an arm, trying to catch a ball the, the next week, could this be a mild form of osteogenesis imperfecta? You know, it's not normal for an adult to have recurrent fractures. I guess it's, that's, that's the, the point. It's not, it's not normal. Um, torrential bleeding. Um, could this be some um, uh, so, sort of bleeding diathesis? Um, common ones being von Willebrand's disease. And again, von Willebrand's disease uh, can have a bit of a spectrum. Um, and that might present, for instance, in a, um, in a young woman um, who has menorrhagia. And so whilst, you know, I guess what's the saying, if you hear um, who think horses is not zebras, so it could be she has run-of-the-mill menorrhagia, um, but um, most women don't have torrential bleeding um, with uh, their periods. Could this actually be a bleeding diathesis uh, is the question. Um, and obviously there are more severe bleeding uh, diatheses such as haemophilia, but they generally present in um, childhood. Unusual presentation um, of a disease. So certainly um, uh, bronchiectasis, if you had a 70-year-old with, with bronchiectasis who you know, had a lifetime history of smoking, then you probably think, well, you know, we've, we've got some sort of smoking um, um, issue going on there, or smoking related disease. Um, but a young person, if they're not smoking, has bronchiectasis, Again, this is going to be genetic, um, and there are a number of causes of, um, of, of bronchiectasis, genetic causes of bronchiectasis. So I've named a few there. So cystic fibrosis is a again a condition which generally is a um, childhood condition which is uh, detected before symptoms and signs present because of screening, um, newborn screening. Um, but there are attenuated phenotypes uh, which may present in adulthood um, with primary infertility. Um, or bronchiectasis or um, sinus disease. Um, so um, again, the, the idea here is you know, you're dealing with an unusual presentation. Um, you know, if the ciliary, cilia in the lungs aren't working, you're not getting clearance, um, then you're chronic lung disease. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency um, um, is another, uh, I guess, not uncommon cause of, of bronchiectasis. So, um, you know, an unusual presentation of a condition should ring alarm bells. Then if you've got multiple illnesses in the one person, again, this is this pattern recognition that I was referring to before. This is a time when you start thinking, could these two, three or four diagnoses even be, be related? Um, and again, it might take a little bit of detective work, um, but often, you know, the detective work might be a simple Google search, to be honest. And a number of times I've had doctors ring me saying, I've got a patient with, you know, with this these features and I typed them into Google and I got this, do you think it could be that? Um, you know, I've, I've, that's not an infrequent call I've had, um, um, but it's, you know, it's certainly um, good to see people thinking about genetic conditions. And the example I give here on this slide um, is renal uh, disease and type two diabetes. Um, so again, if you had a person with renal failure and type two diabetes, if they're young, they, you know, they don't have sort of, you know, your metabolic syndrome or syndrome X, um, this is looking a little bit odd, got multiple illnesses, and certainly there is um, a, a condition called renal cyst diabetes syndrome, um, um, which is uh, easily tested for. 
So let's have a look at some of, um, I guess, the more common heritable, heritable conditions. Um, genetic conditions don't tend to be, to be common by and large. Um, but as I said, I tried to um, focus on conditions that I thought likely to work through the door of a general practice. So the first is hereditary um, hemochromatosis. And Sabrina's put up the question there. Just, uh, I'm just interested for you guys online. Um, who has a patient or more than one patient with hemochromatosis? I'll get you just to uh, pop onto Slido now and, and answer that question. Wow. So we've got 55% more than one, 18% have one. So that's 70% you know, of <coughs> people you know, have patients with, with hemochromatosis. So that's, that's um, I guess, a testament to um, you know, how common this, this condition is. Um, I'm going to test technology here. I don't know if I can do this. Sabrina, hang on. Forgive me while I'm um, playing around with the technology. Um, so what I want to know is, of those of you who have patients with hemochromatosis, um, who has tested other family members? All right, so don't you love webinars? <laughs> so I've put that there. So the next question which you see um, next is, if you've had a patient with hemochromatosis, who's gone and done, I guess, what we call castate testing for other family members? And, hey, oh, here we go. No, the numbers are changing. We're looking at 60, 40, yes, no. Getting it towards 50, 50. So I guess it's a bit of an unfair question without being able to have further discussion with you um, because you might not test other family members because that's you know, your, only, your only patient. So you might um, um, not be able to test other family members. Yeah, so that's about 60% of people have got patient or more than one patient with um, hereditary hemochromatosis have gone on to test other family members. Um, so uh, it's good that people are thinking you know, this is genetic. We need to think about you know, the risk to other family members. And that's one of the big um, things about genetics is um, as a uh, specialty is you're not just thinking about the person in front of you, but you're thinking about um, their relatives and not just um, you know, children and, and parents, brothers, sisters, um, but also more distant relatives. Um, and the part of the genetic consultation is um, supplying um, the person in front of you with some sort of information that they can distribute uh, throughout uh, the family so that they can um, all um, you know, have the opportunity to, to look at uh, their genetic risk. So the reason why we've... Um, um, got so many um, of you online tonight who've got patients with hemochromatosis is because it is a common genetic disorder. Um, it is a um, you know, disease of, um, of white people, Caucasians. Um, so these incidence figures of you know, you know, one in 200 to one in 500 um, is only for people of sort of European ancestry. Um, and I guess the demographics of a state like Queensland tends to, uh, is, you know, quite European. So that's why um, we see quite a bit of it here. Um, the condition um, is basically caused by a decreased ability to rid the body of iron. So um, iron is, is lost generally <coughs> through uh, shedding of um, epithelial cells in the gut, the skin, etc. cetera. Um, and, um, these, uh, the, the body's unable to ex, uh, rid itself of, of, of iron through these normal channels. Um, and so um, people continue to take iron on 
um, and because it's not got rid of it, it accumulates and precipitates in organs, um, mainly um, sort of endocrine and exocrine organs, uh, liver, pancreas, uh, pituitary, uh, testes, um, but also in the heart, um, which leads to uh, damage. So um, the uh, presentation is usually due to one of the, the organs beginning to fail, um, but it's usually um, something that's quite non-specific to, to start with. Um, but certainly, you know, if you start to look at liver function tests, then they'll be a bit skewed if pancreas gut starts to go, then you might have early onset diabetes. Um, um, you could have anything on the um, pituitary, endocrine pituitary axis. Um, in males, um, you'd be looking at uh, decreased uh, libido um, or, you know, signs of, of, of decreased vascularization. So, um, you know, de decreased adrenalization, um, losing um, body hair, et cetera. Um, and then in the joints, um, the iron can precipitate to cause an arthritis. But as I said, the early symptoms are generally pretty non-specific and vague, lethargy, abdominal pain. Um, but because hereditary chromatosis is common, um, and because those symptoms are vague, then you need to have a very low threshold to investigate patients for this uh, condition. Um, but thankfully, um, it's pretty easy to test for. It doesn't need any fancy genetic tests even. Um, just need full iron studies. Uh, don't ask for serum iron. That's not useful. It tells you about it, you know, about the last steak they ate. What you're looking at is, what you want to do is look for um, those iron parameters which reflect this iron stores. Um, so that's uh, the ferritin and transferrin um, saturation. And both of those will be increased um, in hereditary hemochromatosis. Um, so that's meant to say it's, it, it is a, a biochemical um, iron overload. Um, and it's due to the mutations in this gene HFE. And what HFE does encodes the protein HFE. And it's not a really well understood what the role of HFE is, other than that if it's not working properly, then you can't rid the body of iron. Um, so the actual um, uh, mechanistics behind it, I, I can't tell you about because because we don't know. Um, but I guess one of my philosophies of this type of um, talk is not to go into mechanistics and um, technicalities. I try to keep this uh, broad and um, a bit light for um, a, a weeknight. Um, but it's uh, primarily due to this one mutation in HFE, uh, the C282Y uh, mutation. Um, but there is a less common mutation, uh, the uh, H63D mutation. Um, and these are on the, on the um, Medicare uh, benefit schedule. So if you've got a patient with iron parameters that suggest a, um, hereditary hemochromatosis, then you know, they can technically be bulk billed um, for a simple gene test. And that's a very cheap gene test, actually. It's a you know, single mutation. So we're looking at you know, 30 bucks to the, to the Australian government. Um, and the nice thing is that should um, a patient um, be shown to, to have the condition, or even if they're just found to be a carrier, um, then the um, government will also pick up the tab to do cascade testing of first degree members. Um, and the reason you'd like to do cascade testing of first degree members is um, because obviously they might um, have the condition or they might be um, uh, carriers themselves. Um, now, this is a treatable disorder, as you know, it's treated by um, phlebotomy. Um, and so um, it's something that's worth diagnosing early and certainly something that's um, worth um, offering testing to other members so they can um, ascertain their, their risks. Now, it is an autosomal recessive condition. So you should have uh, two mutations if you're going to have it. Um, um, so looking back at those mutations, um, generally people um, are homozygous, that is, they have two copies of the C28. Uh, to Y mutation, or their compound heterozygous, meaning they have the C282Y mutation and the um, H63G mutation. Um, the, you don't really see homozygosity for the H63D mutation because it's a rare mutation. Um, um, and it's, uh, uh, they, they, I guess, yeah, it's a rare mutation. That's, that's the main reason you don't, you don't see it. Um, and the, the Medicare benefit schedule you know, always tests for the C282Y um, mutation first in the first instance and goes on to look at the second only if that's found. Um, but if it is uh, recessive, as you recall from last week's um, uh, presentation, 
then the parents must at least be carriers. Um, so um, um, it's worth testing them. All the siblings have a one in four chance of, of um, having those two mutations themselves. Um, and because it's a late onset disease, um, you know, it's possible that they have that had those two mutations and just haven't manifested any signs of it yet. And all the offspring will at least be carriers. Um, um, and so testing can be offered to them. I guess if you're a health economist, you'd probably just you know, test the partner of, of the person who has the condition. And if they're not a carrier, then the, the children won't be affected. Uh, but the Medicare benefit schedule doesn't work that way. Family history might um, trick you um, with this condition um, because it's um, a, um, the carrier frequency is, is common, then uh, sort of one in 10 people um, and you know, one in two to 500 people affected, then you um, can have this, what they call a pseudo-dominant um, family um, tree. So even though um, um, it is inherited in a recessive condition, because it can come down uh, both sides of the family through multiple branches, it can affect multiple generations and the family tree may appear uh, uh, to be a dominant condition um, when it's not, it's just that that's just a reflection that you know, this is a common uh, recessive um, mutation that's uh, showing itself in the family. So just to, I thought I'd sort of mix it up um, um, with, um, uh, I guess, ethnic specific diseases and look at the hemoglobin apathies. So again, we're, we're looking, I guess, you know, something we associate with blood. So hemoglobin apathies, um, um, can be divided into two, um, the thalassemias and the structural um, um, hemoglobinopathies or the true hemoglobinopathies. The thalassemias um, is where you lose one of your uh, hemoglobin chains. So recall that hemoglobin is a tetramer made up of two beta and two alpha, alpha chains. And um, what thalassemia is, um, is, is when you're missing um, one, two or even three of those chains. Um, and so the, um, um, there's a, a, decreased amount, a, a decreased amount of, of um, globin in the, in, the, in the system to make a, a adequate amount of, of hemoglobin is, is a good way of thinking about it. Now, depending on what chain you have missing, if you're missing alpha chains and it's an alpha thalassemia, if you're missing beta chain, it's a beta thalassemia. Um, as opposed to the structural aberrations, um, where that's where the um, the conformation of the chain is, is uh, different, so I can't sort of grab onto the oxygen as efficiently um, um, as it should be able to. Now, again, these conditions are excessively inherited, but they tend to present in childhood, so um, they're not really adult onset diseases. Um, uh, but it is important, um, and they, they tend to be severe diseases, as in they're you know, transfusion dependent. Um, but you need to be aware of it in adults um, because um, you know adults procreate, and uh, so fertile adults have an increased chance of having children with uh, with a hemoglobinopathy. Um, now they're a bit tricky um, uh, because carriers um, can manifest a phenotype, so uh, that phenotype is uh, generally, um, or is, well, it's not um, one that you need to be concerned about. Um, so it doesn't cause any health effects, um, but the phenotype is something that you can look for quite easily on, on blood, blood parameters for the thalassemias at least. Uh, so if they've got um, a mutation, then they'll uh, tend to have a, a, a microcytic um, anemia. With the, with the true hemoglobinopathy, such as sickle cell disease, um, blood parameters tend to be normal. So uh, just undertaking a full uh, blood count and examination won't necessarily pick um, those individuals up. Um, so um, it is worth uh, just doing that one um, uh, more sophisticated test, the hemoglo hemoglobin electrophoresis, um, which looks at the conformation of um, th those globin proteins. Um, and again, you should be able to uh, pick up um, carriers um, between your full blood count and, a, and an electrophoresis. Um, the um, hemoglobinopathies um, tend to have a different ethnic background from the hemochromatosis, and these are from these tend to be found in people from an equatorial ancestry. So um, Asia, in particular Southeast Asia, 
Um, they have a founder effect for alpha thalassemia. Africa, um, look at the sickle cell disease and also um, beta thalassemia. Middle East is beta thalassemia. Um, and it's thought that in the heterozygous state, so the carrier state, um, having that mild confirmation to your haemoglobin is protective against uh, tropical diseases, in particular malaria. Um, I don't think that's ever been proven. I'm pretty sure that still remains a theory, um, but that's um, why it's thought to be um, found um, amongst disparate ancestral groups, but all having that equatorial um, ancestry in common. Okay. So now to something a little bit less uh, common, uh, neurofibromatosis. Um, so this is uh, certainly when we talk about you know, diseases I see, this is common. So it's got an incidence of about one in 3,000, one in 5,000. Um, so what I might ask now is, uh, Who has a patient with NF1? I'll just type this in. Just have a think about. Do you have any? Have you ever seen NF1? Um, so that question should be released to you soon. Here we go. Thanks, Sabrina. There's a patient with NF1. So, that's really interesting. So as I'm learning about Slido, I can see how it works and I can see now that I've had 12 people answer that question and two thirds don't have a patient. So four of 12 people have a patient with NF1. So I think that's, um, well, I'd have expected maybe a few more than that. So it's um, you know, a common condition um, from a genetic point of view. Um, now it's fully penetrant, meaning that if you've got a mutation, then you're gonna have signs of the condition um, and at a young age for that matter. So that if people have features of it, then they're gonna have it, you know, they say by the age of five years, um, but the thing is, the, um, the most common or the, the fully penetrant um, features um, don't tend to cause um, health issues. So we've got a, just a couple of uh, pictures that I've taken from the website Gene Reviews, which I highly commend to you if you really want to uh, look in detail about any genetic disorders you might be interested in. Um, so the first is uh, those so-called cafe au lait uh, macules. Uh, needs to be multiple. Um, so there are there are specific diagnostic criteria. So um, for cafe au macules, it needs to be more than five. Then there's a bit of a, a size. I won't actually won't bore you with the, the full diagnostic criteria, but they need to be of a certain size, um, greater than half a centimeter in prepubescent, greater than 15 millimeters in postpubescent. Um, these these are a picture here of the cafe au macules. Um, these are the ones on gene review. In my experience, they don't tend to be that dark. They tend to be um, um, lighter. So, I mean, cafe au lait, of course, is um, French for you know, a milky coffee. And I think that's a very nice description. It's, it's that kind of tone. They, but these ones here seem to be a bit too dark for the typical um, cafe au lait that I see in, in NF1. Um, freckles in the uh, axilla or inguinal regions. Um, and the other uh, common features is multiple neurofibromas. And these um, tend to not be um, something that people find significant necessarily. So we've got someone with um, you know, a picture of their legs and the, you know, because, um, you know, these are photos that we're going to sh be showing uh, significant uh, neurofibromas. Um, these are difficult to describe, but they, you, they're the things that you kind of see, but not really feel. So this individual here seems to have uh, fleshy lumps under their skin, and you go to feel them, and they kind of disappear. Um, they can they can be hard. Um, that's that's not true of all neurofibromas, but they tend to be um, sort of these non-specific lumps, which especially if they occur on the face, in particular in women, rather more so than men, um, uh, for reasons I don't particularly know, but it's, that seems to be um, 
our experience um, be cosmetically quite um, debilitating to, to, to some people. Um, but if they're just sort of occurring in the trunk or the arms or the legs, then, then less so, uh, but not necessarily always. Um, and these neurofibromas, um, um, which are, I guess, benign tumours of the underlying nerves, sheaths, um, which, you know, sort of amorphous, can kind of grow and expand and get into the, the uh, soft tissues around them and they uh, call, uh, become what they call a plexiform neurofibroma. And that's what's happening in this person's left lower leg here. Um, which I guess almost looks like ankle edema, I suppose. But it's this plexiform neurofibroma where this tumor is, um, whilst it's benign, as in it's not you know, malignant with metastatic potential, it's still invading uh, the tissue planes there um, and um, um, you know, causing disfigurement. And that can occur um, sort of um, intra abdominally as well. Um, and these plexiform neurofibromas, especially if they occur on the face, you know, can be quite debilitating. But generally, um, people um, are not significantly affected. They just have these interesting cutaneous manifestations. Um, and a, it's certainly something that can just walk through your door um, in an adult who's just not been diagnosed before, uh, simply because um, no one's bothered to think of or look at it uh, because it hasn't been a, you know, a health condition as such. It's just been some curious skin findings. And certainly, um, you know, I've had a couple of cases now where you know, a child has been referred to me um, with significant uh, features of neurofibromatosis, um, but um, and no one's thought about the diagnosis in the family and you go and look at the, one of the parents and they clearly have it, um, but the diagnosis has never been made because it's not one that's really um, been an issue for them. Um, so you just need to be a little bit um, cognizant of the, the skin manifestations because if it's going to work, work through your door or previously undiagnosed, that's what a patient's going to have. Now, there are significant complications which can um, be associated with NF1 and that's, and that's why um, we like to diagnose it. Um, I so mentioned the neurofibromas. They um, can turn malignant. It's unusual, but that's possible. Optic glioma um, is a... Um, tumour of the optic nerve, obviously. Whilst it's not necessarily malignant, it can um, impinge on the optic nerve, causing blindness. And so children with NF1 need um, ophthalmic surveillance. The risk for optic glioma really tends to be concentrated in childhood. Uh, so guidelines uh, usually stop surveillance in the early 20s, but many people stop before then. Um, and the reason why you, just, you surveil young kids is because they're less likely to say, you know, I'm losing sight in my right eye. Whereas an adult, you know, is more likely to notice it, so they'll self-report should an optic glioma start growing. But young children need um, proactive surveillance. The osseous uh, lesions are congenital, so they're things um, babies are born with. So the sphenoid wing dysplasia, which gives terrible craniofacial malformation, the tibial pseudoarthrosis, um, which is sort of a malunion of a, you know, the mid tibia, is the best way of describing it. Um, that, that can be quite severe, and um, you know, they don't tend to. to to um, grow together uh, can lead to limb amputation, increased risk of various cancers, uh, so brain and adrenal tumours, uh, precocious puberty, uh, delayed sexual development, um, delayed learning disabilities. I, I think probably, um, I'm trying to think of an exception, but I'd, you know, certainly everyone I've met with NF1 um, probably has no more of an IQ than 100. I think they're probably you know, under average rather than over average. Um, so the bell curves shifted in their um, learning abilities. And then obviously down if there are you know, other uh, potential for um, intellectual advancement is at the low end, um, then that gets into the territory of a learning disability. Uh, scoliosis can be severe. That can require um, surgical intervention. And renal artery stenosis is one that's important to um, remain uh, cognizant of because the one thing that adults with NF1 are um, prone to is um, hypertension. So that for those of you who have that patient with um, NF1 and uh, see if I can look at that. So again, I've only had 11 people answer that uh, question. So there's about eight of you who've got a patient. Um, um, then what um, 
you need to be doing is looking at their, their blood pressure. And children, if your patients are children, then you need to be looking at their blood pressure as well. Um, but that's um, at least annually, if not um, more so. Now, should they have hypertension, then the chances are it's going to be essential hypertension and should um, um, respond to um, gen usual treatment. Um, but they do have an increased risk of sinister causes. So those sinister causes are renal artery stenosis. So if the um, hypertension is not um, amenable to, to low dose one um, um, pharmacological um, um, intervention, then you might want to start thinking about looking for a sinister cause. So um, you know, renal Dopplers looking for renal artery stenosis. And then fear chromocytoma is the other one, which is a bit harder to test for. Um, and I don't think that's available on the MBS, but you need to look at things like plasma metanephrines, which is a blood test, or urinary catecholamines. It's looking at the products of a fear chromocytoma. Um, um, usually a FIO is going to have, um, I guess, other features such as, you know, um, um, intermittent flushing and palpitations um, when they have sort of these sprays of catecholamines throughout their system. Uh, but they're, they're things you need to be thinking about. It's sort of some more dominant, so there's a 50% risk um, that each pregnancy will have a child with um, NF1. Um, but it's variable in expressivity. So as I said, you know, I've had children referred to me that's, you know, that have severe um, manifestations. They have one of those bony dysplasias, they're born with those, and you look at the parent, they've just got some skin things. So that's that variability in expression, um, but also variably um, penetrant. So um, by that, um, without wanting to confuse you too much, it's 100% penetrant in people. So everyone who's got the mutation will have features of it, but each expression is variably penetrant. So, you know, one person might have um, six cafe au lait, so that fits the diagnostic criteria, tick, um, but their child might have hundreds of cafe au lait, so there's variability in that penetrance. So it's quite a variable condition. And that's a, a, a truism, I suppose, of dominant conditions in general that they tend to be quite variable. Um, before we have a break soon, I wanted to touch on um, the cardiomyopathies and um, primary arrhythmias. Um, so these are looking at uh, cardiac genetics. So I'm just going to touch on uh, cardiac and renal conditions just as, as general groups. I'm not going to go into the, the features of these um, in detail because uh, we don't have time and there'll be just too much information and I don't want to give you information overload. Um, but these are things that I guess you need to be aware of um, as, as a group of conditions. So when looking at the um, inherited cardiac conditions, these are primarily autosomal dominant conditions. Um, and as I just said, dominant conditions tend to be variable in their, in their penetrance. Um, but they're important ones to recognise uh, because they carry this risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, which is obviously something you know you'd rather not uh, learn that you have, um, but you'd rather would know about it in some ways because there are interventions available um, which can prevent death. Uh, so they are important conditions um, to to have um, yeah, have been thinking about. Um, I've, this is a, a case um, that I kind of just plucked straight out of one of your the readings that I uh, uh, gave you in the in the pre-reading brochure we sent around. Um, um, but I've actually heard this story uh, multiple times. Um, Genetic Health Queensland um, has a, a specialist um, cardiac genetic clinic, um, which I've never, well, actually I had attended, but just a couple of times. Um, so I've never actually come across this story uh, in person, but it's one that I've heard recounted a number of times. And I think I even saw it um, on the television once. I think it was a, one of those um, pseudo current affairs shows. Um, um, of a couple talking about um, um, one of the partners, again, just like this case, a woman, a young woman who had recurrent fainting, recurrent syncope. Um, and again, that's a, that's a bit of a red flag. Like, you know, if, you, if you've got an adult who's fainting each month, that's not normal. Um, you know, was, what's going on here? Um, what happened in the case in the reading was that she had a fight with her dad. Um, so she obviously got herself worked up. Um, she lost consciousness. Um, and then basically died. She wasn't able to be resuscitated. Uh, had a normal post-mortem. Um, obviously, it was a cranial case, so she had a post-mortem, which was completely normal. Um, and then underwent this molecular autopsy. And if you think right back to the starter presentation, when I was looking at sort of that um, across the life uh, spectrum um, infographic on where we use genomics, um, molecular autopsy is a um, 
uh, becoming embedded in routine practice, um, especially for cases like this, um, where we're looking for genetic causes of sudden death. And she had a um, pathogenic um, mutation, I've got written there, I should say variant, in, the, um, in a potassium per channel gene, KCNH2, and that's um, associated with one of the long QT syndromes, which you've no doubt heard about. Um, in the case of the, this family, um, um, Cascade was testing was undertaken in the family and her mum was found to have the same variant. Um, and she's obviously went on to have cardiac surveillance, was, was treated um, with propranolol, um, um, which uh, protects against um, arrhythmias associated um, with these dysrhythmias. So what are potential presentations of your um, inherited cardiac diseases? So that you know, recurrent unexplained fainting um, is, is, a, is a big flag. Um, but also we go back to our family history. Um, you know, people who have suddenly died of a cardiac arrest um, um, is, a, is, a, is a big clue. Um, and it might, might not be immediately apparent. So, um, you know, if you have your um, um, dysrhythmic event underwater or while you're driving, then, it, you know, the, the death might be put down to an unexplained drown drowning or motor vehicle accident. Um, so you need to think a little bit laterally um, in that regard. Um, whilst it's unusual for these conditions to present in childhood, it's certainly possible. Um, and so sudden infant death syndrome is another way that a cardiac arrhythmia um, could, could appear. So again, that's um, the kind of the conditions you might think about where you, you know, die suddenly and have a normal autopsy, I, I guess. Um, um, and then obviously if you're in the family, if you've got people with um, unexplained syncope, or even seizures, if syncope, um, um, so cardiac arrhythmia can um, present as um, um, a seizure, um, yes, the brain starved of oxygen. So again, thinking laterally, um, looking at unusual conditions in multiple family members or in the one, one person. Um, the frontline investigation is not a, a gene test, it's a um, cardiac test, so an um, echocardiogram. So if an echocardiogram is looking at your uh, true cardiomyopathies um, or an ECG and better, a halter looking for your dysrhythmic is. And so these are the two um, broad conditions of these, of these conditions. So they're the cardiomyopathies. So these uh, tend to be caused by mutations in the cardiac muscle proteins um, and in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, um, as the name implies, there's a, a thickening of the, the heart muscle, or I guess more accurately, uh, we start getting a, a um, infiltration um, of the, um, the heart. Um, um, and it leads to cardiac thickening and that it has a, a rhythmogenic potential. So um, it, whilst it um, primarily disrupts the, the cardiac muscle, um, and certainly if you don't have a, an arrhythmogenic potential, then um, a cardiac, such a cardiomyopathy will eventually, left untreated, go on and um, you, know, you will develop um, a, a cardiac failure because the muscle's not um, working properly. But before that, um, the um, um, electrical functioning of the heart is disrupted and so you, you can have a um, cardiac dysrhythmia which can be treated with an implantable defibrillator potentially. Um, or it depends on the cardiologist. It's really the realm of the cardiologist. Uh, before that, you, know, you might be uh, looking at something like a propranolol like you do with the primary arrhythmias. And then there's um, um, the dilated cardiomyopathies, which again tend to be caused by uh, mutations in those genes encoding cardiac muscle proteins. But the phenotype's a bit different on ultrasound. It's not a hypertrophy. It's um, the, the cardiac, uh, the ventricles are dilated um, instead. And then your primary arrhythmia is your big ones, your long QT syndrome, of which there are multiple types. Um, and the other ones, Regarda syndrome, which you might have heard of. Um, and these are caused by mutations in ion channels. Uh, so uh, sodium, potassium, calcium, uh, those ions which um, your electrical wiring of the heart uses to, to transmit the electrical signals. Uh, so if they're not working properly, then um, you can have a cardiac arrhythmia. And then just looking at the inherited nephropathies in adults, um, these could be considered in any young adult. So again, that red flag adult with renal impairment. So the common types are the um, um, autosomal dominant 
polycystic kidney disease. Um, and I've just noticed that time's getting on us. So I won't ask who's got a patient with AD, PKD, or just another polycystic kidney disease. Um, I've left out the K in, the, in my thing there. Um, but the other ones, the basement membrane disease or Alport syndrome or Alport syndrome, depending on who you're talking to. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease um, is a autosomal dominant condition, duh, no surprises there. Um, but de novo mutations are common. And again, that's one of the truisms of dominant conditions. Um, generally, you, about 50%, maybe 40% of cases are due to a new mutation in the family. And they can have end stage renal failure by the age of 60 years. The phenotype is quite distinctive um, on ultrasound. Um, so obviously, if you've got a patient with um, you know, renal impairment um, um, biochemically, then you'll need to investigate that further. Um, but this is something that an ultrasonographer will put um, the probe on the belly and have a look at the kidneys and make the diagnosis straight away because they've got these multiple really large cysts um, in the kidneys, which can have cysts in other organs, such as liver, pancreas, um, and then I guess it gets analogous to that so cysts in brain vessels, so cerebral an aneurysms. Um, and then there are two main genes there, the PKD1 and PKD2, although a couple more have been associated recently. Um, and uh, these are useful to, to get, have genetic testing. This is not available on the, on the, pharmac on the Medicare benefits schedule. Um, so you're probably better off sending them to your local public genetics testing uh, service for testing because it can be quite expensive, these tests. Um, but that's to undertake cascade testing. You don't really need testing to confirm the diagnosis in the, in the person themselves because the phenotype's so striking. Um, but, you know, if there are other family members, in particular kids, um, it's cascade testing is worthwhile because um, you need to know whether you need to be monitoring them or not. And then the membrane diseases, basement membrane diseases, um, these are um, due to mutations in collagen 4. Um, and it's, it's a spectrum of disease. Um, so mild mutations just lead to a little bit of um, some red blood cells being able to escape through the kidneys, so the filtration in the, in the glomerulus in the, in the kidneys. And so that's just isolated microscopic hematuria. So if you've got a patient who's otherwise well and has persistent uh, microscopic hematuria, the chances are they've got what we call thin membrane disease, um, which is the mild end of the spectrum of Alport disease. Alport disease um, is the severe end of the spectrum, and that's where you have um, you know, a significant mutation in one of your, your collagen-4 proteins. Um, so that's collagen-4, not four proteins. Um, so collagen-4 um, is a multimer made up of three different proteins. Um, now, this can be inherited um, in, a, in an X-linked fashion, a recessive fashion or a dominant fashion. So whilst family histories... Um, um, Helpful if, if you've got one, then it's not helpful telling you which of those um, genes you're going to have a mutation in. The X-linked um, can affect males and females. That's why it's X-linked dominant, but males tend to be more severely affected. Um, and this uh, ends in, results in end-stage renal disease. Alport syndrome, which is the severe end, does have syndromic associations. So they include sensorineural hearing loss. So here you've got a patient who's got... Um, Renal impairment and sensorineural hearing loss, they're two unusual things. You need to start thinking about something genetic. Um, and they can get a number of eye findings, but the one that's got the most significant uh, health implication is cataract. Um, but the finding that's pathognomonic really of Alport syndrome is this anterior le uh, lenticonus, which is really just a shape um, of the, of the, uh, the lens, um, which an ophthalmologist looks at through um, slit lamp examinations. So I've just noticed a couple of questions come through on, on Slido. So I might just actually deal with those now because, um, yes, we can hear. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, so the um, little comments and questions we've had, uh, often patients are already aware. I think that must be going back to the uh, hemochromatosis. So that was just a comment on hemochromatosis um, that um, family members talk to each other, which is good. Um, Jennifer's asked, um, I've got two sisters diagnosed with long QT. Um, can genetic testing be done? It certainly can. Um, and I would, I would strongly encourage um, genetic testing to be done. Um, so we've got two sisters here. Um, so long QT is one of those conditions where I would take the diagnosis with a bit of grain of salt, um, and, you know, depending on the cardiologist who's, who's diagnosed it. Um, 
um, it's got the potential to be overdiagnosed. Um, but if you've got two sisters with it, then, then it's unlikely that they're both going to you know, have false diagnoses. Um, the reason why um, long QT syndrome should have a genetic diagnosis is, is cascade testing. So the a genetic diagnosis isn't going to um, um, change management of your two sisters, Jennifer, um, but because it's dominant, then you know there's um, 50 percent chance that any first degree relatives also going to have the condition um, and as I said before it's something that there's interventions available that you know people can die suddenly from this so it's important for the people to to know if they've got a genetic risk um, so I'd be sending them along to your local genetic service to have to have gene testing um, um, I mean, I say send along to genetic service. There's no reason why um, it couldn't be done in general practice, especially if it's diagnostic. If you're a patient with long QT and you say, well, I want to know the genetic cause, um, but that would incur a bill for your patient. Um, the lab might come back to you and say, oh, well, where do you want it sent? Can you get the DNA consent? Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of technicalities behind it. So it might be easy for you, Jennifer, just to send to your local genetic service. And they'd be seen by the, the cardiac genetics clinic if um, in, or a regional clinic if they're, they're Queensland patients. But yes, I strongly recommend people with long QT syndrome do have genetic testing. Uh, Kim, I hope I've said your name right, um, has asked um, at what age uh, can Alport syndrome, what age Alport, I think the question is what age does Alport syndrome present? In, symptoms start to present such as hearing loss, renal problems. Um, well, there are different uh, genetic causes of Alport syndrome. So your typical um, X-linked textbook case um, um, will present in, in childhood, um, it tends to be males in childhood, but it can really present at any age. The um, hematuria, so this is microscopic hematuria, haste and tad, um, I guess that's there throughout life. I've, uh, it should be age dependent, um, but you don't go around doing urinalyses on asymptomatic children, do you? So, um, you know, people will go through um, childhood without um, having knowledge that they've got persistent hematuria. Um, but the, hear the um, hearing loss and the, um, uh, I guess, renal impairment will start to, to kick in um, with the, I guess, textbook Alport syndrome, late childhood, adult, um, early adulthood. Um, but there's variability in that, um, especially X-linked in a female, it's going to be later in life. Uh, the dominant sort is going to be later in life, um, but the textbook Alport syndromes, um, late, late childhood, early adulthood, cataracts are late, um, sort of a late adult issue, uh, but certainly um, full-blown end-stage renal disease, you're looking at 40s um, generally. Then we've got a uh, patient here with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome contemplating pregnancy. She's been told it's not amenable to genetic testing prenatal antenatally. Lindsay, thanks for that question. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, again, it's one of those uh, diagnoses which I take with a grain of salt. Um, it's a, I guess what we call a connective tissue dysplasia. And again, there's quite a spectrum. Um, I'll, I, um, I guess, only believe a diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, you know, once I've examined the question, my, the patient myself, um, there's certainly, um, I guess, the, the subtle qualitative features you find in the joint hypermobility and skin elasticity in mild, in even mild Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which just you know screams for yeah, you've got it. Um, uh, it's a Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, I guess, is a, a change in your connective tissues. Um, and there's, there's a spectrum um, and some people um, can be just a little bit bendy and it's not pathogenic. And when it start, when you start calling, you know, you know hyper, just general benign hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you know, there's no textbook definition of where that line is drawn. It tends to be autosomal dominant. Um, and it's true that our genetic testing for the condition um, has been pretty limited simply because it's the connective tissue genes are multiple, so you're not just looking at one, generally the, the collagens, um, um, but it's not just one collagen, um, and the connective tissue genes are, are big and complex and hard to sequence. Um, so genetic testing has generally been quite difficult for this group of disorders. But if your patient 
um, you know, has a condition that um, um, I'm just presuming it's a she, yeah, she's, um, it does find, you know, to be medically significant, um, it can be, it can be a debilitating condition, um, you know, persistent joint pain, um, tiredness, fatigue, um, it can be quite a, quite a significant condition, um, and it's something she doesn't want to pass on to her kids, then yeah, I, I would be something I could look into genetic testing for. Um, there was a um, report actually recently, I think it was in the popular press, ABC Media, I think, ABC News maybe, of a woman who had these sort of non-specific um, chronic fatigue type uh, symptomatology, muscle aches and pains, and was sort of just... Um, you know, written off as it's sort of you know psychosomatic disease. Um, eventually, found someone who did next generation sequencing on her and found a mutation in a collagen gene, thus confirming a diagnosis of Ehlers Danlos syndrome. So, with these next generation sequencing, which we're about to go on and talk about now, um, mutation finding a mutation is a lot easier than it used to be. So, whilst ten years ago I, I would have given the same advice that you're not, it's not amenable. It's you know you're, we're not going to do genetic testing. Um, you know, certainly um, um, genetic testing now is is much more possible. Not guaranteed that we would find a genetic cause, but um, Leslie, uh, sorry, Lindsay, um, we, uh, genetic testing is possible. Um, and should a mutation be found, there's no guarantee it would be, but if should a mutation be found, then that information can be used for pregnancy uh, planning. Okay, thanks for your questions. So let's get back to the presentation. We're almost at eight o'clock here. My goodness, maybe it's a good thing no one's um, submitted questions because we're going to go right up to 8.30. Um, so sharing your screen, my screen, back to our presentation. So molecular platforms, um, as you know, I, I don't want to bore you guys with um, the technicalities and specifics of things. I want to keep things general, just you know, to, to maximise the, the chance that you, you know, remember what I say, rather than dr be drowned in, in the minutiae of genetics. So I'm not going to bore you with um, molecular theory um, I just want to take, take to the specifics of um, genetic testing. So I'll keep talking about next generation sequencing. Um, that's differentiate from you know, traditional genetic sequencing, what we call first generation sequencing. So these are what um, most of our genetic tests, um, or all our genetic tests were before um, this brave new world of next generation sequencing um, entered our, entered our um, collective consciousness. You might have heard the term Sanger sequencing, so that's named after the scientist Sanger who first described this, um, and this is, you know, it's just a really neat piece of technology um, which has served, you know, for uh, many decades, um, you know, the way we, we sequence DNA. It's, you know, Sanger sequencing is the way we sequenced the human genome the first time around. Um, um, very expensive <laughs> when you do it multiple times. It only looks at short stretches of DNA. That's why it was very expensive because you can only do one bit of a, one bit of a gene at a time. Um, and so we, these days, um, you know, we use it for common mutations. So you know, we know the two mutations that cause hemochromatosis. We don't want to look at the whole genome just to diagnose that. So we look at uh, common recurrent mutations, um, you know, factor five laden, you know, a common thrombophilia. Um, if a phenotype is associated with mutations in a small gene or even an exon of a gene, then you're just going to use Sanger sequencing. You don't want to look at the whole genome. And then while well, I'm talking about cascade testing in families, even if um, you know, someone had a mutation in a gene that was found through next generation sequencing, if you're doing cascade testing, then you don't want to spend all that money looking at you know, the next person's entire genome. You just want to do Sanger sequencing, looking at that small stretch of gene DNA. Um, it's, uh, I said I wouldn't go into technicalities and the next line <laughs> is a technicality, um, but it's, it's basically a PCR reaction. You recall that PCR, poly polymerase chain reaction, is a way that we can uh, replicate uh, uh, DNA. And so it's basically replicating a small stretch of DNA, but um, that replication reactions terminated at each base pair um, um, by incorporation of a, um, DNA base which emits a colour basically and also terminates a chain reaction and because the um, chain react the um, chain is terminated then at each base then you've basically got um, a short stretch of DNA um, that's terminated by one base pair so they're all different sizes and so they're separated out on the basis of size and you can look at the colour and on the basis of colour you know what your um, 
uh, your base pair is, um, and you get your sequence. It's, it's very, it's quite simple. They've got automated machines that do it um, um, these days, um, and you get a nice readout like that. And it's very cheap. Um, so if you look at your, your, your um, uh, Medicare benefit schedule, um, the rebates generally in, in the vicinity for a single point um, um, mutation for about 30 bucks. So obviously if you're doing more than that, it, the, the costs increase, but it's, it's very cheap and that's why it's um, you know, still useful and we'll still use it for the foreseeable future. Um, next generation sequencing, however, and we did talk about this last week, um, is um, you know, slowly taken over from first generation sequencing when we're looking, um, when we're wanting to look at um, big genes, multiple genes, um, conditions that could potentially have one of many genetic causes. This is a high throughput technology. We're sequencing the entire genome, and you can sequence more than one person's genome. But it's the other thing about these next generation sequences is that you can put multiple samples in. Um, so that uh, helps bring down the cost, obviously. Um, the two types you might hear about are whole genome. So that's um, looking at the genes and everything in between, um, which you get more information for, but it's more expensive and it's more data to sift through. Um, or more commonly whole exome. So they're just the um, encoding genes, basically. Um, but even though we're sequencing the entire um, exome or the whole entire genome, you don't need to really look at it all. Um, there are methods by which you can only just look at genes of interest. And so these are genetic panels you might come across. So if one of the reasons I mentioned those two um, groups of disorders before, the um, inherited cardiomyopathies and, and uh, dysrhythmias and the renal genes is because there are multiple genetic causes for those conditions. Um, and one of the reasons genetic testing uh, for those conditions has been uh, difficult, if not impossible in the past, is that it's just, um, well, we didn't know what the genes for starters, but also it was unaffordable to go looking at all those genes uh, for mutations, whereas next generation sequencing now allows that. So, um, um, and then we've got more questions coming on here on the Ellers danlos syndrome. Um, but so these, these um, there's you know, multiple collagen genes can uh, result in these connective tissue displays. So you can have connective tissue panels. Um, and so basically you can just amplify those genes that you're interested of note. Or you can go at the, at the other end of the sequencing reaction, you can only look at those genes that you're interested in. So you don't have to look at everything and that brings down your costs associated with bioinformatics. Um, and the way next generation sequencing works is basically um, we cut up all the DNA, um, um, amplify those little sections. So it's again, it's a, the, the amplification. Um, um, and then um, we align those little segments um, to um, a, a reference sequence. So, sorry, first the, 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 the segments are labeled so you know which part of the genome they come from or whose genome they came from. They're, that's aligned to a reference sequence and then those uh, sequences are all, all lined up. And if you do that once, um, you know, it's not going to be accurate. You have to do it multiple times to make sure that your alignment is a true reflection. Um, and so um, that's, you might hear the term depth of sequencing. And so you need a, a, a good diagnostic sequence should be about 30 times or more. Um, um, you can, the more times you do it, the, the more expensive it, it becomes, but you know, you can be looking at these, um, uh, the depths can go 80, 100 or more times. Um, now this does generate a large amount of data um, and this requires quite a bit of bioinformatics um, to, to process. Um, and interpret the findings. And this is really where all the cost comes in next generation sequencing. Um, it's not through the, the fancy machines, it's the actual um, analyzing the data. Um, now, parts of that data analysis um, is uh, done by computers, but it's not fully automated, I'll say yet. Um, certainly as um, um, artificial intelligence becomes more advanced, I'm sure one day it will be automated, but at the moment it still does require um, a good old fashioned brain power. And usually there's more than one member of the team who's um, interrogating that data. Um, so that manual interrogation is used to make sure that those sequence um, alignments look accurate. So you know, we're, we're happy that um, um, that part with that mutation is actually be belongs to the part of the genome that the, the data is telling us it belongs to. Um, and it looks 
to make sure that it amplified correctly. So we, for various technical reasons, um, reasons of the genome may not amplify, you might not get that depth of coverage that you, that you want. So you find a mutation in a region that's, um, for whatever reason, didn't have an adequate depth of coverage, then you need to be a bit circumspect that the mutation you found is real. So um, it's, there's a lot of um, um, technicalities with, with this technology. It's not, it's not a simple put the blood in one end and then the answer comes out the other. Um, these, when you find a variant that needs to be curated, so, you know, if you've got, um, you know, a common hemochromatosis mutation, then it's like, yeah, fine, we know what that means. It, there's not much curation involved there. Um, um, but many other variants, uh, um, you need to look at the evidence that support um, its pathogenicity before you, before you issue a report saying that you've found a, a mutation. And that's one of the downsides um, of next generation sequencing. So while it's in, you know it's great technology, it's by no means um, you know, the panacea. Um, you can have incidental findings. Um, so you, obviously, if you're looking at the entire genome, um, you can find things that you weren't necessarily looking for. Now that could be an upside if it's an important piece of information that's life saving, um, but it might be something that you didn't want to know about. Um, so an incidental findings defined by a pathogenic variant in a gene which isn't associated with the phenotype you're being, that you're testing the patient for. Now the American College of Medical Genomics, uh, Genetics and Genomics came out, oh gee, I think it must have been 2015 maybe, maybe a bit before that, saying that we actually, um, actually it was a bit before that, it might have been 2013, saying that we you know, should be um, reporting um, incidental findings if we find them, if there's interventions that exist. And they went further to publish a list of um, disease associated genes that um, they say you should actually be actively looking for mutations in these disease, in these genes because they cause disease which we can um, ameliorate or prevent. Now not everyone agreed with that statement around the world and not everyone agreed with their list of genes, um, but certainly um, you'll find that um, um, it's something that may be on offer if you happen to be ordering a next generation sequencing panel. Even if you're only looking, if you're interested in, in renal genetics genes, then there might be a tick box. Do you want to know about other conditions that are medically actionable is the, is the buzzword, Med medically actionable. Now, just because you find a um, variant in a gene, it doesn't mean we know what it does. So that's one of the downsides of um, next generation sequencing. As you know, the more variants, the more genes you look at, the more likely you are to find a variant. We've all got variants, and the more variants you find, the more likely it is that we actually don't know what it means. So it could be a variant of uncertain significance, which can have people scratching their heads and can actually lead to patient distress. Um, and it's a costly um, um, technology. So as I told you last week, it is on the NBS, but only for kids um, with developmental disability. Uh, well, it's not strictly true, but um, the, the MBS rebate is $2,100. Um, and that really only just covers a good quality um, NGS panel. Most labs are probably, um, their outlays will be a bit more simply because they, um, you, you know, your specialist genomic labs are going to be using multiple staff um, and bioinformaticians for that variant curation. The pathogenicity, and um, this is a repeat slide from last month, um, is ascribed on the basis of evidence. Um, now, the evidence that we look at is the segregation of the family. So, you know, if mum and dad have the same disease and the same variant, that's evidence that the variant is causing the disease, but it's not proving, prove it. it doesn't prove it by any stretch of the imagination because, you know, mother and child are gonna have 50% um, uh, variants in common, aren't they? Um, um, but then if you, the bigger the family, the more people you've got to test, you can, the better you can see if the variant is segregating with the disease in the family. Obviously, people around the world, if they've um, in the, you know, write these things up in the medical literature, and if it's been reported in the literature before, in particular, if it's had functional studies, actually get into the lab and show that what the protein does. And then if you cause the mutation, um, you can show that functionally it makes a change that you expect to cause the disease. And that's further evidence. Um, uh, we can infer what the functional effect that the mutation has on the protein. So whether uh, you, the, the protein you know, becomes more active or as it loses function. And we'll talk about these types of mutations more in the cancer genomics uh, lecture. 
Um, but those predictions can be made based on the type of mutation and you can relate that to the phenotype. Um, if it's a rare mutation, so you generally less than 1% of the normal population, then that's evidence of pathogenicity. And then if it's a variant that's um, conserved against uh, throughout the species, so if you go back through nematodes, through, you know, through to chickens, rats, and up to humans, um, if you know, that amino acid um, is conserved in the protein or the homologue across all those species, and all of a sudden you've got a patient who's got a mutation that we predict causes a problem with that um, protein, then that's further evidence that you know, this disease, this uh, mutation is causing a problem. Um, now all that evidence is collated together and there's um, um, scoring systems that can be used and it's, uh, your variant is ascribed a level of pathogenicity. And what you want is a report that says, yep, it's pathogenic or this is normal. There's no variant, uh, there's no um, um, if, buts or maybes with that report. What you don't really want is a variant of uncertain significance because you're not none the wiser, you're kind of shrugging, shrugging your shoulders. Um, but you can get reports that say, well, we think it's benign, but we're not 100% sure, likely benign. Um, and uh, we think it's pathogenic, but we're not 100% sure, likely pathogenic. And so these are um, areas where you might want to speak to your local friendly clinical geneticist to say, well, is there something we need to be worried about or not? That can require a bit um, more um, interpretation. I wanted to uh, talk about an old technology, which is still quite frequently used in, in research, um, but has made its way into direct-to-consumer testing, which we'll segue into next. And this is association studies. So association studies um, are a type of genetic um, um, test or study, which doesn't actually look for causative mutations um, in genes or even look for you know, the genes necessarily that cause disease, but they look for variants in the genome that appear to be associated with the gene, with the disease rather. So I'll say that again, they look for variants in the genome which appear to be associated with disease. Now those variants are these so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms. So that just means um, a um, substitution at a single base at some point in the genome. Um, and these single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs um, are, are very useful um, and they're very common in these association studies where people look for um, a, 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 a many SNPs. They, they tend to be large studies looking at SNPs across the genome and people want to see um, do they have SNP A or SNP B um, in a, at a, each of the many thousands of loci um, in people with and without the disease. Um, and so they work on the hypothesis that if a certain SNP um, is present in a greater proportion of people who have the disease, then that SNP is probably near um, the cause of that disease. So it's near the gene um, of that disease. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the gene or causing the disease, but it's associated again with the disease. And it assumes that marker or that SNP um, basically arose uh, um, on the same, what we call ancestral haplotype, as this putative genetic mutation. So again, I don't want to bore you with technicalities, but this term equally linked disequilibrium means that two points in the DNA tend to stay together. So you'll recall um, from medical school, hopefully, that before you pass on your genes and chromosomes to your kids, everything gets mixed up. Um, and pass and then you know packaged into sperm and egg cells um, so to make sure that we have um, diversity that's called recombination but recombination i mean that mix up doesn't occur to things that are you know physically well you know usually physically proximate um, and so this is what a haplotype is things that seem to stick together and so what these association studies assume is that because things stay together that a mutation that runs through the population is likely to be co-inherited with the SNP because it's physically next to it and this has been occurring down through many many generations. So again these and but you know there's nothing um, ironclad about that it's an assumption and um, certainly markers can and will become disassociated from their genes. 
And so these are the, the basis of these so-called genome-wide association studies. Um, and so this is a, this picture here is called a Manton pattern plot, um, and that's basically the output of looking at thousands of markers across the genome. So that's what each of those um, little dots on the graph are um, in this Manhattan plot. Each color represents a different chromosome. Um, and what you'll see is these little peaks starting to, to peak up. And so that's showing that in these regions here, these, the SNPs that they're looking at have, um, have been found more frequently in this disease population um, than you'd otherwise um, expect um, by chance. And so I'm just trying to read the title of the paper here, four novel loci influence microcirculation. So they're looking at some phenotype of microcirculation and they're saying they've reached statistical significance that their SNP is available, is um, associated with this aberration. I haven't read the paper, so I can't tell you what it is on four different occasions. So presumably um, this chromosome, uh, I can't read that, six, eight, 12 and 19. Um, so four SNPs associated. And so these association studies, what generally the next thing is people look at those genetic regions or genomic regions and start honing in. It's sort of like a, you know, let's start honing in and see what genes are there and see if there's anything there that looks like it, you know, is involved in, in um, circulation and that's how gene discoveries may be made. What the problem we've got is that people have used this um, association to offer genetic testing. And this is important because in, in direct-to-consumer testing. So as I said, these aren't causative um, variants. Um, they are only associations. Um, and generally, they are associations in complex diseases. So whilst um, you know, a single base change in a gene, so for instance, we'll go back to the hemochromatosis um, um, example, you know, that technically you could call that a SNP, a single base change, um, but it's a, a um, single gene disorder. That's something that we know is a highly penetrant Mendelian disorder. More commonly, what we're dealing with are multiple SNPs, so multiple variants that are associated with um, um, a disease. And so having a SNP doesn't cause the disease in itself. It's, I guess, gives uh, increased propensity to, for that condition. And it's usually more than one SNP, it's usually multiple SNPs. Um, and so, um, and, and overlaying that complexity is the fact that there are also environmental issue, uh, issues that come into play with these complex uh, diseases. So you've got multiple genetic contributions, environmental factors, and so you get this spectrum. So whilst the genetic data is out there showing um, a SNP, is associated with disease, that by no means means it's causative, in particular in isolation. And so this is where I was going into direct-to-consumer testing. We've had our break. And basically, a rule with direct-to-consumer testing is you get what you pay for. So if a patient has gone on the internet and has paid for a cheap test, then it's likely that they've paid for rubbish. One of the problems we have with the general public is they don't understand genetic testing. And in one of the articles I was reading about direct-to-consumer testing recently, it gave an anecdote of um, a couple who wanted to know their risk of having a child with genetic disorder and actually went on to Ancestry.com and got a report looking at where their forebears came from. So this is, again, SNP testing, and it's very good SNP testing. You can tell a person's ancestry through their SNP patterns. Um, but they didn't understand genetics and thought, well, I can't remember the exact details, but for example, you know, we're Caucasian and the ancestry testing tells me that my forebears are Caucasian, so we don't have anything to worry about. So they kind of interpreted their expected ancestry test as normal, uh, which it was for them, and then went on and extrapolated that as the presumption that they were at low genetic risk for having a child with a genetic condition. So don't automatically assume that your patients are genetic lit genetically literature literate. They can go online, pay for these things and actually get information, which is you know, interesting to know where your forebears came from, but it doesn't have anything to do with your, with your health. There are a plethora of these so-called lifestyle genetic tests, and I've just listed there what one of them you know, it's purports to, to tell you about. 
you know, your risk of ACL injury, your risk of selenium problems, um, the alcohol response, which there's good data there that, that um, you know, your polymorphisms and things like alcohol dehydrogenase you can predict, but is that medically significant? No, not really. Um, how you react to caffeine, you know, do you, you know, do you, um, slow metabolizer or a quick metabolizer. You know, these, these are all very interesting things, but they don't really tell you much about your health. The other thing that is very really, um, upsetting about these types of tests is that they're often um, based on those association studies that I was talking about. So they're not, you know, um, measuring a particular variant in the genome that's directly causative, it's just an association, but for which the evidence is weak. A lot of these genome-wide association studies have, um, um, you know, come up with very uh, weak evidence that two things are associated, or if they are associated, the statistical significance is minimal or non-significant, not, it's not significant. But people who use that information then formulate these directed to consumer tests. And so this is why directed to consumer tests have such a bad um, a reputation in clinical genetic circles. Here's another one um, I found, which um, you get for a similar price, so we're talking about hundreds of dollars. And it's got some things that are, you know, you could, could start to consider a medically significant. What's your risk of developing cardiovascular disease or dementia? But again, these, um, there are monogenetic causes of cardiovascular disease and dementia, absolutely, but they're rare. Um, the things that we spoke about earlier tonight and things that I want you to think that they are possible, but your average person who develops dementia is going to do, get it under, after the age of 65. Your average person with cardiovascular disease is going to get it after the age of 50. That's what it commonly presents, as I said. Common things occur commonly. Um, and so these direct-to-consumer tests aren't looking for the monogenetic causes. What they're looking at are these variants that um, give you an increased or, or potentially decreased risk of developing these complex diseases. So they tend to be um, associations. They tend to be associations which aren't um, um, informative from one SNP, you don't need to look at multiple SNPs, and all of these tests do look at multiple SNPs, but you know, even collating all that data together, you don't necessarily have a strong association, um, and they're certainly not predictive. So what are the red flags you need to look at if a patient comes into your office and bangs a direct-to-consumer test on your desk saying, I'm really worried about this? Well, first thing to look at is, well, what was the cost? So if you're looking at just, you know, certainly anything under, say, $500, so it's, it's, this will be considered inexpensive, and it's very unlikely that that test is something um, that's going to be worth what they paid for. Well, maybe if it's of general interest to them, it might be worth, to, worth it to them, but certainly from, not from a health point of view. Anything that's um, reporting on normal human variation. So for instance, um, in the uh, GP manual that I mentioned before, there's a nice little chat there on um, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase um, polymorphisms, MTHFR. So they that they um, were um, variants. Again, they, these are types of SNPs that were you know, associated with recurrent miscarriage, with um, uh, uh, venothromboembolism. Um, again, through these types of association studies and things that um, you know, we routinely tested for because we thought the association was strong. Um, but turns out it's not. MTHFR testing is you know, not, not worth it. We don't do it clinically anymore. Um, but it still exists in these direct-to-consumer tests because um, we consider those now new, normal human variations, not pathogenic variations. There needs to be other things. Whilst it might increase your risk, it's not, to, it's not sufficient in, in and of itself. There needs to be other things, whether they be genetic or environmental. Now, if the test is talking about things you've never learned about in medical school, so, you know, congenital um, resistance to selenium, then, you know, that's a red flag to me. Look at where the test was undertaken. So not every test has the strict regulatory frameworks and laws of somewhere like Australia. Certainly something like the USA or the UK, I'd be pretty comfortable with tests undertaking there. Something from um, you know, Democratic Republic of Congo or Azerbaijan or um, you know, um, Kyrgyzstan. I'm not going to be particularly um, confident that I'm dealing with something that's um, you know, being undertaken in a, in a well-regulated laboratory. The other big red flag is when they report things as a relative risk. So you've got a increased risk, 
your increased risk of developing dementia is 1.5 times the average. If it's a rel if you if you're um, reporting things at a relative risk, these are data that have been extrapolated from those sort of G the general world association studies I mentioned before, um, and so you can tell that they're not going to be something that's uh, necessarily clinically um, useful. Um, and generally, these increased relative risks don't translate to an increased absolute risk. And I've certainly seen patients who have been really quite upset that they're, they're you know, two times more likely to develop cardiovascular disease or two times more likely to develop dementia. But if their background risk is a low number, one and a half or two times risk a low number is still a low number. So the absolute risk is generally not increased. And so they, they tend to be useless tests. So they're the things I want you to look for um, if someone comes into your office asking about a directed consumer testing, wanting you to interpret it, because it's quite possible that it's actually not worth um, um, the paper it's written on. And certainly it's not something that um, your public genetic service is going to accept a referral on because they'll deem it medically inactionable. Having said that, directed consumer uh, testing for next generation sequencing is becoming more frequent. And we spoke about carrier testing last week. Um, so these do test for um, mutations or variants in genes that directly cause disease. Um, so they do report on real findings. Um, things that, you know, I guess make you comfortable that you're dealing with a rigid dig and next generation sequencing test is that um, the testing was undertaken in some sort of couching of genetic uh, counselling. Um, so a lot of these tests um, will require um, regulatory purposes. So in Australia, UK, even though it's ordered online, patients will have um, some sort of counselling, uh, which um, and um, that will go towards the, the, the cost. The reason why patients will also pay thousands of dollars for this type of testing is because of that bioinformatics, which is very important. Um, is quite involved and that's quite expensive. And so that's another red flag, uh, or sorry, just the opposite of red flag, a green flag, so to tell you that it's a, a good test. It's, and, you know, it's obviously not true 100% of the time. There are charlatans out there. But if they've paid certainly more than, say, $800 or $900, they've paid thousands of dollars, and you're dealing with a next generation sequencing test. As I said, you get what you pay for. Um, these tests if undertaken in a rep, rep, reputable regulatory framework, then um, you're going to um, have proper genetic counselling. Patients are going to be properly consented. And I see we're running out of time, so I might not actually have a chance to talk about consent, but that's okay. We can talk about that next time because it does, um, it is an important topic in, in cancer genetics, but also somewhere like Australia, there needs to be medical involvement. So whether that be a clinical geneticist or genetic pathologist, if you see in the report that you know it's been signed or authorised by a medical person, then again that's going to be um, um, add credence to your test. So I've kind of spoken about this. So what to do if you're confronted by an abnormal test? You need to critically analyse it. Just don't take it on on face value, um, because public genetic services are unlikely to take referrals um, if it's not medically actionable. If there's reporting on normal variants, it's unlikely to be um, you know a useful report. Dubious conditions, things that you've not heard of, unlikely to be a reputable report. Anything with a um, relative risk rather than an absolute risk is unlikely to be a, um, a study that was worth undertaking. However, if you've got something that you know is a, rep a reputable um, report that you've deemed a reputable report, and you think it's uh, something that's going to, um, um, you know, the patient's been shown to have a Mendelian disorder, then your genetic service will be of, of help. So it's 8.27 according to my clock here. Genetic consent I'll talk about um, next time. Looking at the questions, they haven't come in thick and fast. Mike's asked about EDS type 3 is out of scope for GHQ referrals according yeah, to their referral guidelines. So, um, you know, a colleague of mine, actually my, my ex-registrar, he's now uh, in charge of genetic services in uh, Tasmania, wrote a um, clinical guideline which GHQ has taken up um, looking at um, this whole sort of, you've called it ES type 3, you could call it benign um, hypermobility 
um, you know, is that something that public genetic services will look at? Um, and um, as Mike points out, they say they won't, um, simply because it's, it's again, it's common um, and, and unlikely to uh, result in any genetic testing, Mike. So they, they, they can knock those referrals back. Um, and that is a, um, um, you know, a peer reviewed recommendation. Um, um, I, I guess I, I just am a little bit hesitant because I don't want to downplay it as a uh, significant condition for individuals. Um, I hopefully, you know, us doctors have got smarter and we're not saying this is something that's psychosomatic, which is a lot of these people with benign hypermobility or mild Ehlers-Danlos syndrome were labelled as you know, being a bit mad. Um, I think you'll find if you were chronically fatigued and chronic muscle aches and pains, chronic joint um, aches and pains, then you'd probably be a little bit mad too. Um, there is a, you know, a particular windy whiny phenotype I think goes with it, but I think it's because these people just you know, have chronic pain. It's, you've got to feel sorry for them. So I don't want to downplay the significance um, um, of the condition for the individual. Um, and I don't think it's unreasonable if someone has a condition that they want it confirmed genetically, uh, just because you can't do anything with that genetic information, that in itself isn't um, necessarily an excuse not to um, do genetic testing. People like to have confirmation. That knowledge is power. People like that knowledge. Um, um, and it's not necessarily um, a reason not to offer, you know, prenatal testing because the people have had a, um, a, um, a decreased quality of life because of their condition. They don't want to pass it on. I mean, my, you know, I've, my my personal opinion is people terminate pregnancies for far lesser reason than that. If they want to undertake genetic testing for that, um, then um, that's something I'd be happy um, to talk to them about. So you might want to send that type of test, uh, person privately, um, but the issue is, you know, could they afford to have the testing privately? And that's another another discussion. So we're now on eight thirty, and that's all I have for for the question. So we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, we'll send out um, a, a post talk survey, um, just like last time. I'll I'll give you a little formative quiz for you to 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 um, have a go at. So it's only it's only short. I don't see the, your answers, so don't be don't be scared at doing it. And it's just to try and reinforce anything you've learned tonight. Um, the questions that I, I hope that you the, the answers to the questions are things I hope you to remember. The key messages that I wanted you to get out of tonight. So thanks for attending, everyone. Hopefully, I'll see you next month at the Cancer Genetics. We'll talk about genetic testing and consent then. Um, and um, good night. Thanks for attending. <laughs>